everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here today. It's really exciting to be talking at Wired. Um, so to start off my story, just to give you a little bit of a background about who I am. Um, so I was actually working just down the road at Chelsea and Westminster. I'm a medical doctor and I'm still quite a junior doctor, so I just finished my FY2 years. But I had had some experience of working in some sort of extreme and remote environments before I went as part of medical and logistical support teams. So I've been out to Greenland, Svalbard, Siberia, and at the North Pole as well. So Antarctica. So in Antarctica, I was working at Concordia Station. And Concordia Station is situated on the Dome Charlie Plateau, which is kind of the Australia-New Zealand side of Antarctica. And it's one of only three inland stations in Antarctica. And it's what's known as a spaceflight analogue. And so a spaceflight analogue is really ooh, sorry, <laughs> any environment which in some way replicates space. So we have lots of different analogue environments. So you may have heard of Nemo Project, which is kind of an underwater facility. We've got some in caves. We've got this one, which I think was pretty popular, you know, getting paid to spend time in bed. And that's looking at the effects of microgravity. One crew even spent 500 days in a mock-up spaceship in a Russian car park simulating a mission to Mars, and that's called Mars 500. So there's lots of these different analogue programmes and they can all tell us different things. And they're generally either used for astronaut training or for research purposes. Now the thing that makes Concordia interesting is the fact that the crew there are isolated for nine months. And the reason for that is twofold. So the first thing is that it's an extreme environment. So this is a screenshot I took when I was overwintering there. And that just gives you an idea of some of the temperatures and things that we have during the overwinter. And the climate's actually pretty constant. So you can see it's minus 80, so pretty chilly. But it didn't, <laughs> it didn't really get much above minus, uh, sorry, much warmer than that. So the warmest kind of temperatures that we would see at Concordia was about minus 70 during the overwinter period. Of course, a lot less during the summer. Um, and also you might notice that the barometric pressure is actually quite low as well. And that's because we're actually at altitude. So it's a bit like living at the summit of Mont Blanc. And the other thing is the long polar night. So at Concordia, we have 105 days where you don't see the sun at all. And this picture was actually taken at lunchtime. <laughs> And so I'm that little light that you can see just by the station there. So this is what it looked like all the time. You know, you could have breakfast, lunch, dinner, and you could go outside and see the Milky Way outside. And you know, it's a really strange thing to lose the sun. You know, the sun's like that familiar feature. Wherever you go traveling, wherever you are in the world, you always look up and you can see the sun. You know, it kind of reconnects you with life back home. And it, to lose that, you know, without sounding too naff and cheesy, you know, it did really feel like you're on a different planet, like you've gone somewhere new and different. And perhaps that's why a lot of people refer to Concordia as White Mars. And so it's these two features, it's the um, extreme environment and the long polar night, which means that the crew at Concordia are completely inaccessible for those nine months during the winter. And that's even in case of emergency. Um, sorry, so, so let's take the International Space Station. So if an astronaut was to have a medical problem up in space, typically we'd be able to sort of evacuate them within half a day. But if we're looking at going further away into space, so on longer duration missions, so for example to Mars, that's no longer going to be possible. So places like Concordia can help inform us about the psychological pressures that the crew may face and also some of the medical models that we might require. And having spent nine months in isolation at Concordia, I actually think I would have found it much harder to be at a different analogue environment. So, for example, Mars 500, being in the crew in the Russian car park. Because for that crew, you know, it was an artificial isolation. And I probably would have spent 499 of the 500 days wondering whether or not I should leave. And you know, whether it's harder or easier, or whether you left or not, I guess in many ways is irrelevant. Because the interesting thing is that it put a different psychological pressure on the crew. And that's what's interesting about Concordia. And that's what makes it a really nice analogue for long duration space missions of the future. You know, walking out is not an option. 
So there's a few other things which make Concordia a good platform for studying as well. So this was my overwinter crew. Um, it's a 13-person crew, and it's an international crew. So we've got French, Italian, a Swiss German, and myself, a Brit. So we've got all different languages into the mix. And we're also a skeleton crew. So that means that we all have to take on roles above and beyond sort of our, what we're down there to do. So, for example, the plumber and the electrician had all learned how to scrub into theatre and they were all also part of the medical rescue team as well. So, um, we also had the training as well. So we all went to the European Astronauts Centre where we had what's called human behaviour performance training. And this is the same training that astronauts have before they go to space. And it's all about how to live and work effectively um, sort of a as a team in a remote, sort of remote environment. And so that really helped us because it gave us an understanding of the crew before we went down and we were able to pick up on problems a lot earlier than if we hadn't have had that training. But when you get there, you know, although you're isolated, it's a strange thing because you're also very confined. So I've already showed you, you know, the temperature is really, really cold outside. And although you could go outside, and, and a lot of us did, uh, you know, most of us went out sort of every few days or every day, um, you're really living on top of each other. So it's kind of that forced human interaction with a crew that you may not have necessarily chosen yourself um, to be. <laughs> no, I had a nice crew. So. Um, and it's also very, you know, there's not, you know, yeah, it's not a lot to do. I mean, obviously, you've got your research and everything to do, but um, it's the same every day. It's pretty constant. And the environment's very constant as well. So this is what it looks like outside. You know, for the mountaineers and skiers amongst you, it's like, what well, ah, Antarctica, you know. It's not like that at Concordia, unfortunately. It's just completely flat, and you can just see the horizon in every direction. So you get sort of sensory deprivation as well. You don't have the same smells that you have back here. You know, you don't, I didn't see an old person. I didn't see a young person. I didn't see open stretches of water. And I didn't have any fresh fruit or vegetables for nine months. You know? and, and those things really start to get to you after a while. It's quite interesting. And we also recycle our water. So we actually developed a lot of the water recycling technology, which we currently use up on in the International Space Station, down in Concordia. <laughs> The key difference between the technology that we're using at Concordia is the fact that, that we don't actually extract the urine at Concordia. So um, my top tip for anybody thinking of overwintering there is do not pee in the shower because you might get a horrible <laughs> surprise the next day. <laughs> And we're also using telemedicine as well. So we have quite sophisticated telemedicine, and this is us doing a practice link to a hospital in Rome. Um, and there's actually two doctors working at Concordia. So there's myself, sort of the ESA doctor, and then there's also like a clinical doctor on the base who does the day-to-day -day running of the hospital. And obviously, in case of emergency, we're trained to work together. So now I'd like to give you just a bit of an overview of some of the science that we're doing down there. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have enough time to go into great detail about all the experiments we're, we're doing. So I just want to give you a bit of a flavor. And really just highlight the fact as well that Concordia is a research platform run by ESA for lots of different institutions. So all the experiments are designed by different people in different institutions and they're selected by ESA. So, you know, if you have any good ideas, then why not get in touch and, you know, maybe that could be a platform that you could use in the future as well. And a lot of the research that I was doing down in Concordia, unfortunately, hasn't been published yet. So I'll try and give you a bit of an indication of what we found. But um, over the next few months and the next year or so, a lot of it will come out. But Concordia as a platform has been running for a few years, so we do already have some data. So the first experiment I'm going to chat about is an experiment that we're all wearing activity watches. So this just looked like a normal wristwatch, and it's a little bit like a Fitbit. You know, it just tells us about our activity levels, and it's interesting because it shows us about our sleep-wake cycle as well. But perhaps more interestingly than that, this watch actually communicated with other crew members' watches, and it also located us on the base. And so from this, we could get a lot of interesting data about how crew dynamics were changing over time. So, you know, you could look at how relationships are changing, and also you could start to look at sort of crew preferences. So is somebody choosing to kind of seek out social interaction? Are they always hanging out in the sitting room or somewhere where they might expect to see people? Or are they instead spending long periods of time in their bedrooms on their own? 
and starting to look at kind of critical time points in a mission where this might be more or less likely to happen and also where conflicts may start to occur as well. As part of the same experiment, we're also doing functional MRI scanning as well. So we did this before the mission, immediately after getting back, so either in Christchurch or Hobart, so sort of on the first day of getting back, and then again six months afterwards. And we're also doing a 10-part cognition test, and these were all part of the same experiment. And this cognition test was looking at lots of different areas, so from risk-taking behavior to reaction times to kind of memory testing. And the idea is that astronauts are going to do this on a regular basis, and it's really just a screening tool. Kind of, um, the idea is that astronauts test themselves against themselves, and any dip in performance is really just the red flag for mission control to be like, why is this astronaut dipping? Are they getting enough sleep? You know, are they having emotional problems? What's going on? But what I like about this is experiment is while we were down, doing it down at Concordia, astronauts were also doing it up in space at exactly the same time. And this really just demonstrates how platforms like Concordia are also useful for increasing subject numbers as well. Because if we relied on astronauts alone, technologies would be developed a lot more slowly because we, don't, we just don't have the subject numbers. So that's another real big benefit of platforms like Concordia. So we're also doing video diaries. So again, a bit like Big Brother, you know, go into the video room and um, chat about how your week had been. But Koala, which is the name of this experiment, wasn't really interested in what you were saying, but rather how you were saying it. So the idea is to develop technology which may be able to sort of work out how you're feeling regardless of what you're actually saying when you call back to mission control. So we're also at altitude, so we had an arterial blood gas machine down there, and we were taking capillary samples and looking at chronic acclimatization um, over time. And this was me in the gym, and it was actually towards the end of my mission, so I've been there for over 12 months at this point. And I knew from my blood test that I'd acclimatized reasonably well, but still with just a little bit of exercise, you know, my stats were dropping to 88% pretty quickly, and that was typical for everyone out there. And we're also collecting what we call extremophile bacteria, or searching for, so looking to find any bacteria which can survive outside in the extreme environment that we have at Concordia. And this is just to remind me to say that there was lots of other experiments going on, and you know, as I say, I can't go into detail about all of them, but we're taking lots of different samples. You know, I still have a short bit of hair in the back of my head because we took so many hair samples. And so every time we go to the hairdresser, they're like, what's this? You know, so, so you, if you're going to go down to Concordia, expect to, expect to give a lot of blood. And all of the experiments change year on year. So this is a new experiment which was coming in just as I was leaving. And this is actually the Soyuz space flight simulator. And it's the actual one that astronauts use to train on. And the idea of this one is to look at um, sort of optimizing training schedules over time. Because you know, when we arrive at Mars, it really would be a shame if we've forgotten how to land the spaceship. So why travel deep into space? You know, why explore and, and what relevance does that have to healthcare? And you know, why am I here talking today, essentially? You know, for me, exploration is about so much more than just getting somewhere and putting down a flag. You know, it's about those that we affect along our journey. And you know, it's interesting to think about all the sort of international collaboration which is facilitated by the research that we're doing, people that it inspires, but perhaps more importantly, it's also the driving force behind technological innovation and research. And so, just 50 years after Amundsen reached the pole, Yuri Gagarin left for space. And although close in time points, these, um, these achievements were light years apart in terms of their technological requirements. You know, Yuri would never have got to space if he had only had access to Amundsen's ship, the Fram. And so that's the really exciting thing about exploration and, and science sort of, and that's a good reason for going a long way into space. I mean, if you look at the International Space Station, perhaps more than a spaceship, it could be considered a research laboratory with astronauts spending a lot of their time doing research. And so while we're looking out towards the stars, you know, um, and sort of beyond the atmosphere, we're also helping life back on Earth. And you only have to look at the research that we're doing at Concordia to see that. 
So all of the research that we're doing had medical applications. And perhaps a nice example of that is one that we were doing, which was looking at the effects of artificial lighting on our eyesight during the long polar night. And while, of course, that's really relevant to astronauts and you know, the fairly small group of Antarctic overwinterers, it's also really relevant to a lot of people who are spending a lot of time on night shifts or, you know, for example, factory workers. And so, um, although a manned mission into deep space may still be some time away, I think we can learn a lot about the research and the technology that we're developing and use it in healthcare today. And I'm really excited about the future. You know, together we can work together to find solutions to a lot of problems which are going to help patients both in space but also back here on Earth. Thanks. <laughs>